Okay, welcome to this video. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about passive and active transport, but I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the membrane. So, biological membranes are made up of lipids. proteins and cholesterol, which is also technically a type of lipid, but it's, you know, like a fat, right? So we have lipids and proteins. Those are the main things that we're going to talk about today. So let's look at lipids really quickly and see what they look like. Now, generally, when we draw lipids in like cartoonish form, we draw them as a two-tailed head like this. And this is a lipid. And the top of this is hydrophilic. And the tails are hydrophobic. And this has to do with the way that they're constructed. And they're constructed actually from combining a alcohol, which looks like this. It's a triol. We know this now, or we can. This triol is actually has another name called glycerol, but let's keep with the official name. So here we have one, two, three. This is propan one, two, three, triol fairly straightforward name. These, this, this glycerol, right, combines with um, um, a, um, sorry, a carboxylic acid, which has a really long tail. And if a carboxylic acid has a really long tail, we call it a fatty acid. When these two combine, they form then, and I'll draw it over here now, right? They form a molecule that's sort of similar to this one, where you have the three carbons, right? And then you have this ester, it's called an ester uh, bond, and then you have these long tails. And two of these carbons on the original alcohol do this, like so. And then the rest of it, you know, looks like looked like it did before. And then the third carbon sometimes gets this, and then you sometimes call it like triglyceride or something. But normally, then this one gets one of our phosphate groups, what we've learned so much about, attached. And when they when the phosphate group gets attached, and you have these two tails that are made up of fatty acids, we call it a phos lipid and this is then the picture that we draw for a phospholipid and of course the reason it's hydrophilic it's even more hydrophilic when there's a phosphate attached like this this is not a particularly uh, does not have all the properties that you need for a proper hydrophilic and hydrophobic part where the boundary between fatty acid and carboxylic acid goes usually is around five carbons. So longer than five carbons usually gets called like a fatty acid. If it's shorter than five carbons, of course you can call it a fatty acid, but no one does. They just call it a carboxylic acid. And this happens all the time where you, there's a sort of an arbitrary boundary between the two. But if it's longer than five carbons, you can be pretty happy calling it a fatty acid. Sometimes these are, of course, have double bonds. And then of course they are unsaturated fatty acids, like olive oil and stuff like that. And if they have many double bonds, they're called poly uh, unsaturated uh, fatty acids. Okay, enough about that. So let's move on then to talk a little bit about the properties of the cell membrane. 
The cell membrane, in fact all biological membranes, are then made up of these um, lipids. And these lipids then, with their two tails, form a structure that looks like this, where the two tails, the tails are pointed towards each other and the, the heads are pointed out. And this is then what we call the phospholipid bilayer membrane. Now this is very impenetrable. These membranes, and I'm, I'm not going to draw the membrane anymore. I'm just going to draw it like a big shh, like this instead. I mean, they're all over. So, you know, I'll draw a few here and there just to indicate that that's what I'm talking about. It continues like a sea of these things going all the way across. This thing is very impenetrable. There are very few things that could diffuse directly through. The handful of things that diffuse directly through are things like O2, which is a nonpolar gas. N2, which is a nonpolar gas. So you have a, um, some molecules that are able to go through. They are mostly then uh, gases, like CO2 is also a gas that can move through the membrane without any openings. It can go straight through the lipid bilayer. But many other molecules cannot go through. For example, water goes through very, very, very slowly. It doesn't move very quickly at all. Uh, there are some other polar molecules that can move through, like ethanol, um, CH3, like C2H5, so like ethanol can move through very, very, very slowly. Uh, ethanoic acid, you know, acetic acid can move through very, very, very slowly. But the only ones that really move through freely are then these nonpolar gases. Everything else has to go through some way. And like large molecules like sugar, they don't go through at all. So if I drew this, this again here, right, if I drew it again, and we're just going to draw these in here really quickly, right, just to indicate that this is a, a membrane, right, sugar will not go through. Proteins, you know, peptides, right, peptides, it may be any kind of peptide, even like uh, amino acids and stuff like that, will not go through. Fats will not go through. They're completely blocked from going through the membrane. So in order to accomplish that, the membrane has different properties that it has. So if we look at it, we'll just draw another picture here. We'll sh show what I mean, right? That the cell then is surrounded by membrane, but all of the organelles in the body are also, right, surrounded by membrane. And of course, we want all of these different types of molecules to move freely or under controlled circumstances into these different compartments. So we need sugar. We need to get sugar in there, right? Otherwise, we can't have respiration. We need to get fat in here. Otherwise, we can't have another type of respiration and other types of metabolisms going on in here. We need peptides to get in here, amino acids to get in here. And we need them to move freely between the different organelles. So the organelles and the membrane of the outer cell have on their surface, on this membrane surface, we have different membrane proteins. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. So I'm going to draw a really large membrane here at the bottom. And then just to indicate what kind of proteins there are. Okay, these membrane proteins can be on the surface. Right, the outer surface. 
They can be on the inner surface. And it doesn't matter which surface we're talking about. We can talk about the outside of the cell, the inside of the cell. We can talk about the inside of the organelle, the outside of the organelle. We can talk about the inside of the nucleus, the outside of the nucleus. All these, it's all relative speaking here, right? Then you can have proteins that go, that are inside the membrane. So they're stuck in the sea of lipids. Right, they're floating around there in the middle, right? And then you can have proteins that go all the way through from one side to the other. And these are then called transmembrane proteins. We're gonna focus on a few types now that are important for our understanding of active and passive transport. So in order to talk about that, let's talk a little bit about them, the three, the different types. So I'm gonna draw a membrane here and I'm gonna just draw it like this. And then I'm gonna put in a few lipids just to tell you that this is a membrane that has two lipids, lipid layers. And then I'm gonna draw in a, um, a a protein and the protein is going to be drawn in blue here and this protein then that I'm going to draw first is called a channel now channels allow the movement of specific particles through the membrane as if it were just a hole sometimes. So let's put here, let's put this sodium plus here. And so now this becomes suddenly, this channel now becomes a sodium channel. We could put potassium here, then this channel would be a potassium channel. Sometimes they can use the same channel, but often they have their own unique channel to go through the membrane. So this channel then is for, you know, a specific particle and it allows the movement but then when we talk about the movement, it's going to allow passive movement. So when we talk about ions then, we mean diffusion. And of course, if you need to go back, we can go through diffusion quickly again, but basically diffusion just means that if you have a higher concentration over here, it's going to move through because, the, because there's a lower concentration down here. So channels allow for passive transport. The next major type, and we'll just keep drawing the membrane a little bit over here. We'll put little little dudes here that represent lipids. All right. The next type of transport is going to be then uh, using something called a transporter. But usually in English, we don't call them transporter, but the, the general name is transporter. The transporter is similar to the channel, except for the transporter is a larger and these this is what we call then a transporter protein but oftentimes we call them pumps and we'll get into why they're called pumps in just a little bit these transporter proteins allow for the movement of larger molecules so here we have the movement of something larger, right? And they're very specific. So these, these are small channels allow for the movement of small ions, usually small atoms, charged atoms and stuff. But a transporter is for then the transport of larger molecules. And these includes things like uh, amino acids, sugars, 
fats. They need a special type of opening here because they need to be open and closed. You can't have this stuff flowing in and out. So this stuff is, uh, these are very specific things that don't actually stay open like a channel can, like just be like a tube. This thing is gonna open and close. It might still be passive, meaning that the amino acid or the sugar or the fat will diffuse right, by a passive process of going from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. But they're not going to be, they're going to be very specific. So these are super specific. Specific large openings that allow the movement of large, um, larger molecules. And this can be passive, you know, by diffusion, but it can also be active. And we'll talk about active in just a minute. So those are the two types of things that allow this to go. Now, I'm going to continue this picture a little bit over here, and we'll see what I mean by uh, that you can have other things going on here. And we'll, but just, just to make sure that we understand that the, the uh, protein or the membrane is a quite complicated, complicated thing. In addition to having um, these two opening types, we can also have on the surface, we can have membrane proteins that act as receptors. Now, a receptor... This is, I'm going to write this over here then. A receptor is a very special kind of um, 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 protein that can take up a substance from outside of the cell or outside of the membrane and has an active site for that and that somehow communicates some sort of information into the cell or changes shape when this thing attaches. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So this thing, signal substance, triggers a change. Okay, I'm going to now ch ch switch pictures in the game. So we have channels, we have transpor transporters or transport proteins, which some can sometimes can be pumps, and then we have signal substances, which are also are very important. And we'll get to the, all three of those in just one second. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about channels first. But basically when I talk about channels, I'm just going to basically be repeating some of the things that we've learned earlier about diffusion. Okay, so here's our membrane, and here's our channel. Let's see if I have the right color in front of me. I think I do now. So here's our channel. Okay. So the channel is open most of the time. Almost all, most channels are open constantly, but some channels can be what we call gated. And we'll get to the both of them. Regardless, they are passive, right? So channel, I don't know if I know how to spell this right, is passive, passive transport. And by passive transport, we mean diffusion. And if you don't remember what diffusion is then, right, it's the movement of substances from the higher concentration to lower. So movement from high concentration to low concentration. 
So if we have a high concentration of Na plus on this side of the membrane, and we have a low concentration of Na plus on this side of the membrane, this is going to move through the channel into here to equal out the concentrations on both sides of the channel. The interesting thing about many channels is, is though, is that they have the ability to close. So the channel can be what we call gated. So the gated channel then has the ability to open and close and then uh, inhibit or, you know, stop the flow. So this is still going to want to flow through there, but if the channel is closed, then of course the concentration will not equal out, and you'll have a high, you'll have continue to have a higher concentration on one side of the membrane as compared to the other side. These channels or these gates can often be controlled, and these are often controlled then by some sort of signal substance. So these things have. Uh, these enzymes, or these these are actually enzymes then, because they have they have some sort of active site that regulates the opening and closing of the gate. But if the gate is open, then it's just diffusion, and then the active site can be this thing can have some sort of signal substance that attaches that either when it's attached, it's closed or the other way around. When it's not attached, it's closed. It doesn't matter. There's some sort of mechanism for opening and closing the channel. This is also going to be true of the um, transporters. They're gonna have the similar properties, but they're sometimes much more sophisticated because we can highly regulate them. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about a transporter that is really important, uh, that also works on the principle of diffusion. Can I turn it around? Yeah, that looks pretty good. So let's look at then a transporter that's really important. So one transporter that's extremely important, I'm not gonna go into all the details, right? Is, so here's my membrane, here's the other, the other side of the membrane on the other side of the protein. And here we have our transporter. Uh, there's a particularly important one on most cells, a transporter or a larger thing where the signal substance is actually then, this is the opening and closing of this is controlled by a, a molecule called insulin. So in the presence of insulin, then this transporter will open and it will allow for the diffusion of sugar from the blood, right? This is blood up here, right? Blood, it's blue blood. Like, like the king. Um, so you have sugar in the blood, and then it's diffusing out of the, the, the capillaries, and it's filling the spaces around the cells, and then, but it will continue, it'll do it even faster if the cells allow the uh, sugar to enter and enter. But the cells won't allow the sugar to enter un unless there's insulin present. So insulin will then regulate the transporter that allows the passive transport of sugar into the cell. So this is the cell down here. And that's sort of another example then of a transporter. And now let's talk a little bit about then these receptors that I mentioned earlier, right? Receptors can have all sorts of different functions. I'm going to talk about one in specific. So this is going to be a kind of a larger drawing here, but we're going to draw then the receptor here. And the receptor sits here, and then you have the receptor site, and here's an R mole, here's our thing. Let's say that this receptor has um, an active site that allows for the importation of something like fat. Now, when a fat molecule approaches a cell, the fat's not something that the cell's gonna take in, usually by active, by uh, transport. It's gonna do something a little bit unique. So here's our receptor, and it's, it's identified, oh, this is a big piece of fat or lipids that I want to import into the cell. 
what's going to happen is, is that this is going to attach to the receptor. And I'm not going to draw very many more details of the membrane now. The receptor is going to attach here. Or the, the uh, sorry, the the little molecule, the tran the signal substance that attaches to this particular receptor is going to attach. And now you've got a fat globule attached to the outer membrane of this whatever cell mem vesicle or organelle. The organelle now, this membrane is now going to actually this receptor is now going to change shape. And it's going to cause the membrane to buckle or go inwards. So the receptor has now caused some sort of structural change in the membrane itself, which causes the membrane to sort of buckle inwards. And as it buckles inwards, the fat molecule starts to become surrounded by membrane. And as it does so, the membrane will become even more, you know, pushed in and more buckled until finally you actually get kind of like a bubble forming. And the bubble has formed around this fat molecule. Well, this, this may, may not be a molecule, maybe a bunch of them actually. And eventually what happens is, is that the membrane ties off and you get A vesicle. Which now can move freely into the cell, bringing it with, it with them. So this is called what we call endocytosis. Which literally means bringing into the cell. Endo into cytos cell, into cell. This can happen when you have receptors on the outside surface. Okay? So that's one type of transport that is not passive, not diffusion or osmosis. The second type that I'm going to talk about now is reliant on uh, a special type of transporter. So I'm going to draw one more dra drawing here. Make sure that you understand it's a lipid bilayer on each side. Right. So and now we're going to draw a special transporter in here. So this transporter is going to have a special shape. I'm going to draw like an up, like kind of like a, like a peach or like open, I don't know, like pie that's been cut in half or something. I don't know. It's hard, like so. Now this, we're going to call this a pump. Now on the, in, we're going to call this the outside, and we're going to call this the inside. It doesn't matter where they are, but let's say it's the outside of the cell, and this is the inside of the cell. Now let's say we want to transport something from the outside to the cell to the inside. The only time we would want to do this is if we want to transport it against the gradient. So when we talk about active transport, What we're trying to do is we're trying to move stuff, material, against the gradient. That means that we have a high concentration on the inside. Let's say we have a high concentration of calcium, 2 plus in here. And we have a low concentration or a lower concentration of calcium two plus on the outside, but we still want to bring this in where we want to increase the concentration even more. 
So what we have here is we have a bunch of active sites for calcium. So let's find a color for calcium, like purple is a lovely color, I think. So we take calcium and we put it on here. There's an, there's an active site here that maybe allows for the attachment of two calciums. And what happens then is that you can take and invest ATP. And you invest ATP into this protein, and the protein changes shape. Right, ATP turns into ADP, so there's an oxidation reduction taking place. And what happens is, is that this Pac-Man thing turns over. Now, I made a mistake by not drawing it properly, but you know you have to live with that, right? So, oh, uh, right. So the Pac-Man thing turns over, and now the calciums end up on the inside of this cell. And they can move out into the cell like this. And so what you've done is you've actively transported them from one side to the other by making an investment of, of energy. So an active transport requires energy to move something from a lower concentration to a higher concentration. So basically what you're doing here is you're doing work. in order to do something that doesn't happen by itself. Passive transport, like diffusion and osmosis, they're going to happen by themselves. But things that don't happen by themselves require in active transport, which requires the investment of energy in the form of some sort of chemical uh, energy carrier, like ATP, NADH, NADPH which we kind of know some stuff about already. So that's my little video on active transport and the membrane. I'm now going to make another video uh, that talks a little bit about um, uh, where this is applied in, in cell metabolism.